all to this POSI session, which is on the last day. We are having a last session of this AIOS. And um, we have a galaxy of speakers in this. To begin with, uh, I call upon Dr. Rishikesh Mai. His talk would be No Surgery, Please, Managing the Paralytic Squint, Non-Surgical Way. Six minutes, huh, Rishikesh? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank we you, Sposi. We can discuss uh, questions one or two after your talk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sposi, and uh, thank you, all uh, AIS, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to discuss the non-surgical methods of managing uh, uh, paralytic strabismus. Uh, no financial interest. Uh, uh, basically, once you start doing strabismus, you don't have financial interest, actually. So uh, <laughs> uh, so why go non-surgical? Because uh, their initial mode of treatment can has to be non-surgical. You can't directly jump for surgery. Uh, in cases where surgery is contraindicated for any medical reasons, or uh, uh, many of the cases of paralytic strabismus uh, they show recovery or they show variability with time so you cannot actually judge what is the angle which you need to treat them uh, also you uh, many of the cases even if they are corrected may, may be non-fusers and can lead to diplopia in the uh, so we have to take care of that also and uh, uh, also if the patient is not uh, convinced with uh, the realistic goals of surgical treatment then better to wait till he gets convinced and try to manage him non-surgically uh, uh, strabismus can be committant and incommittent I'm going to discuss only the uh, the modalities of non-surgical treatment of paralytic strabismus, which happen to be uh, all of these. One by one, I'll just explain uh, in short. Uh, glasses, actually, glasses do not correct the paralytic strabismus, but they act as uh, not only for refractive correction, but they can provide a base on which you can do either occlusion treatment or uh, prism therapy. Also, cases of myopathies or third nerve palsy, if uh, crutch glasses you are contemplating, then they can be added on to the uh, glasses which the ch uh, patient is already wearing. Uh, occlusion, uh, they do not provide provide any binocular vision, but they just block the binocular diplopia. So in cases of third nerve paresis with ptosis, obviously patient will not have diplopia as in first patient, but uh, sometimes over glasses you can do an apply an occluder to avoid uh, binocular diplopia. Uh, it is mainly to avoid binocular diplopia, nothing beyond that. Uh, orthoptic exercises also have a limited success. Uh, they, uh, uh, it is believed that, I, I mean, what we advise is to occlude the normal eye and try to uh, uh, tell the patient to try to move the eye in the uh, side of the paretic uh, muscle. Uh, how much that helps, we are, I mean, we really don't know about it, but a patient feels that he's doing something about it. Uh, but the, the definitive treatment to correct the binocularity is either prisms or uh, chemo denervation. Prisms uh, should be, uh, uh, have a huge role in paretic strabismus because they provide stable, diplo uh, they provide diplopia free peri uh, interval, especially in primary gaze and the down gaze. Uh, the advantage is they provide a binocular vision and early relief from binocular diplopia, but the disadvantage is uh, in case of of a uh, cyclotropia or if the angles are variable then prisms may not be the treatment of choice uh, the basic concept is uh, the uh, the image is displaced by the prism towards the base so if you are applying a prism for correction of binocular diplopia it should be apex towards deviation or base towards the face turn uh, so uh, there are two ways of doing uh, uh, using prisms either the cheaper way is to incorporate them into the glasses or the expensive way is the frenal prisms uh, prism glasses have an advantage that they are cheaper and they can correct up to around 10 to 14 prism diopters if you divide them into two eyes. The disadvantage is the glasses are thicker and also uh, they cannot be used for large angle uh, squints. So for large angle squint, the Fresnel prism is the treatment of choice where the multiple prism segments, they get have an additive effect and uh, uh, they correct large angle deviations or li uh, large angle squints. The, uh, disadvantage, uh, the disadvantage of Fresnel prisms is that they are expensive and availability is uh, always an issue. Uh, also that over time, the dust gets settled into the uh, crevices of the peripheral prism and provides uh, a loss, uh, I mean the visual uh, quality goes down. Uh, initially you have to try it with the frenal prism set to correct the diplopia in primary and down gaze and then you, uh, you have to incorporate it as a sticker from the inside of the glasses. The, uh, even if the patient has a fourth nerve pulse and diplopia and down gaze, you can apply the frenal prism only on the lower part. Uh, so as I mentioned that uh, uh, the prism have to be applied with a uh, base towards the face turn, like in case of isotropia it should be base out. So uh, the last uh, 
point in this is the chemo denervation uh, where we temporarily paralyze the ipsilateral antagonist and thereby correct the diplopia or at least reduce the diplopia. The drug of choice is botulinum toxin A, uh, more commonly available as Botox, <coughs> but there are other options also. What, they uh, what it does is that it uh, inhibits the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, thereby leading to flaccid paralysis of the concerned muscle. Uh, it can be used for large angle deviations, even for medical causes if the patient wants an early relief from diplopia. Uh, uh, it is available in one of uh, out of these uh, brands out of which uh, Botox A is the most commonly available. Uh, the advantage of chemo denervation is that uh, it not only corrects diplopia but avoids contracture of ipsilateral antagonist. So if surgery is contemplated later on, the results might be much more predictable. The disadvantage is the effect is temporary and also availability. But I think availability to me is not an issue if you really liaison it with one of the neuro surgeons who use it or neurologists who use it more commonly. The technique is uh, 2.5 to 5 units is injected into the belly of the muscle. It doesn't have any cumulative effect. Uh, like if it's a large angle splint, you don't need to inject more it's uh, I mean more unit that is not what we uh, it is based upon uh, just sharing one patient who had a binocular diplopia in a case of six nerve palsy right sided six nerve palsy uh, uh, as suggested by PBCT there are two ways of doing it uh, either do, uh, you inject it directly into the belly under visualization so the chances of spillover uh, are not there uh, uh, this uh, I mean you don't need to dissect this much because this was along with the medial rectus recession that's why I, I dissected on very large or you can directly do it in OPD also where uh, you can uh, hold the muscle uh, with a uh, superior rectus forcep like in cataract and inject it uh, into the belly of the muscle. So here we don't open the conjunctiva that much. Uh, uh, the usually the effect is seen in uh, one week or two weeks itself. The diplopia free or reduction in diplopia is definitely there. Uh, I haven't seen but as mentioned in literature the most common complication is uh, uh, spillover. So to conclude, uh, non-surgical treatment is the first uh, line of managing uh, paralytic strabismus and paralytic strabismus due to medical causes. They recover completely, but if the patient wants early recovery, botulinum can be used in those cases also, and it provides early relief in pinocular diplopia. Uh, with this, I will conclude. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rishikesh. And just one question, have you ever used the Trenel prisms? Uh, yes, ma'am. I have used it in a couple of cases uh, in an elderly patient. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, this is my own experience that the quality of the vision goes down. I mean, because uh, uh, because there are a lot of crevices in them. So if yes. they are more than one year or. But uh, can we can we reuse them? After cleaning, I have not tried it, but no, I mean we can, can just use. remove it from that patient and can yeah, we reuse yes, them? Yes, but because uh, it's better that we do it rather than our. Yeah, because Dr. Suma was yesterday saying that in cases of intermittent XT, she does it in. Uh, does a prism adaptation test in the yes. OPD. Yes. So must be they must be able to reuse it. Uh, okay. The advantage yeah. of this uh, pr uh, the prism set, the Fresnel prism is for pr <laughs> that has a lot of advantage actually the to check for credit Okay. Okay. We remove them, clean them and you can stick it. Yeah, yeah, that is only for prism adaptation test, not not for use, not for use. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so uh, with this, uh, I call upon the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Deshpande um, could not come, and so I'm calling upon Dr. Shreya Shaha. She's uh, our treasurer, and the SPOSI uh, purse is safe with us. She'll be speaking to us on <laughs> paralytic squint. So we have chosen a guju for a treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we think so she'll multiply. Yes, <laughs> so what do you expect from me? <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Shreya on paralytic squint. What is happening? Nothing, nothing. I'm just searching the the mar cursor is not moving. Okay. Can you help me? The cursor is not moving. I want more pain. Mm -hmm. 
थैंक यू स्पॉट सी डॉक्टर शुभांगी मैम एंड डॉक्टर डेडिया सर सो आई वॉज टोल्ड टू स्पीक ऑन पैरालिटिक्स टू बिजनेस विच इज आउट ऑफ आर थ्री सिक्स सेवन नाइन सेवन सर्जरीज वी कैन सी दैट लॉट मैनी वी हैव पैरालिटिक्स टू बिजनेस इंक्लूडिंग ट्रामेटिक पैरालिटिक्स टू बिजनेस ऑल्सो एंड दिस वॉज पब्लिश्ड इन जर्नल the review of 13 years of experience and we all know how paralytic string uh, strabismus can happen what are the causes demyelinating neurogenic cause myogenic cause cause at neuromuscular junction and the syndromes so the first thing what we should do is cardiac velocity uh, measurement force duction test force generation test intraocular pressure changes in various fields of gaze we all know about saccadic movement the first and foremost thing is history history and history whenever you are dealing with paralytic strabismus so it can be a long term palsy which can be associated by true tilt and you have to uh, associate uh, differentiate it with the ocular tilt or not can be associated with amblyopia also when there is a recent origin there will be fal false orientation or sudden onset there can be associated with diplopia confusion etc so this is the nice uh, video showing that recent origin uh sixth now palsy there will be a pass pointing so you can say that it is uh, recently uh, present you have to check for duction version primary deviation secondary deviation look for inhibitory palsy and gaze palsy so as as i said all the ductions and movement should be checked properly primary deviation mm, secondary deviation and diplopia work up including haze screening diplopia field uh, and all the things we have to do along with fdt fgt and we can do exaggerated fgt or fdt also so especially for uh, superior oblique we have to do exaggerated fdt or you can check the entrap muscle so i'll not show all the detail of video but this is the fdt and fgt so in babies you can just do fdt with the q tip also with the uh, topical anesthesia you have to enroll all the things in your and it should be supported by radiological investigations like ct scan ct ng radio uh, or mri or most of the time dynamic mri is at most important which can tell you so many things dr rishi has already said so many things about electromyelogram so that can be uh, botox is injected and under the guidance of that uh, he has already told everything about non surgical management so i'll not go into detail of it it can be a segmental occlusion and sometime people are giving botox along with bupivacaine but bupivacaine can again cause the thickness of muscle so botox is still the choice of treatment so if we look at the horizontal strabismus sixth now palsy these are the algorithm how you should go for the uh, treatment duction short of midline can do fgt and again duction past midline can do directly plication and resection so this is the whole arg algorithm we can follow simple muscle so this is the simple uh, surgery shown for plication M most of the people nowadays uh, are doing uh, plication rather than the resection so that is very safe and effective management but i prefer to do sclera muscle sclera plication that works very well on my hand uh, so again uh, you have to see that the the it fgt is not midline or you can uh, do a hemorrhagic procedure um, full muscle transposition Uh, Jensen procedure, adjustable cross uh, section, uh, VRT, partial VRT, and Scott's posture suture. So this is in this patient we uh, had a six now palsy. We did modified nish modified Nishida's technique. So eight millimeter behind the muscle, you just pass the non-absorbable suture, split there, and ten millimeter from the telox, you can just put the suture together, and this is the post operatively immediate uh, on the next day the result of modified nishida so that is also a choice of treatment uh, you have to look for uh, strabismus convergence fixes and fixes and then you have to see for saggy eye heavy eye knobby eye when you are dealing with the palliative strabismus so whenever there is heavy eye you can just do the loop myoplexy saggy eye recess resect is the choice of treatment again true mr palsy is not available but we found in one case when it was non committant strabismus we just took the patient for r and r and then we did an anterior segment oct and to our surprise the medial rectus was uh, placed nearly at 8 uh, mm so we just anteriorize it back that was a congenital so it was very rare case we found partial laceration also can cause the 
paralysis. I'll not go detail into it. it. But this is the case that presented with the trauma. And you can feel that there, there is a little bit uh, defect, uh, defect in abduction. But when I open, you can see this is a flap tear of the muscle. So anterior part of the muscle is already tear. Then, then you have to take it properly, suture to the uh, insertion. And when you are tying the suture, the idea over here is when you are tying the suture, you have to push the globe towards that uh, uh, that action, so it will not tear the muscle more because the part of the thing is already entrapped in the muscle fracture, uh, bone fracture. So that thing you have to take care. As I said, you have to push the globe when you are passing the suture. So that will bring the anterior part of the suture to the front. So this is traumatic third and sixth nerve palsy, you don't do anything. Duans, we will not discuss here. Mobius, duans, all are ver paratic strabismus. Vertical, uh, cyclovertical and vertical. Before that, I'll just tell traumatic IR palsy and traumatic fourth nerve palsy. So should I go ahead because it's yes, too long, it's okay. Yeah. I, sh I can. Yes. <coughs> so this is a spark three steps test. Uh, Dr. Shubangi is the best for <laughs> person for to deal with the severe oblique surgery, so you can, she can tell you so many things. We do double Maddox road test and torsional pulse, what we can uh, see for ex-cyclotorsion, mainly uh, we expect with congenital palsy, acquired palsy, there will be almost always a significant measurable ex uh, torsion. but if it is congenital, there will be a little 2 to 5 degree of or no ex -cyclotorsion. And whenever there is a bilateral palsy, maybe asymptomatic, can be spontaneous complaint of torsion. Usually they complain tilting doors or frames. So that in that way we can treat. So this is the algorithm, moderate, severe, and uh, if it is uh, IO overaction, if it is more, then we can go up to IO enterization also. So whenever there is plus for IO overaction, Steger's enteronasal transposition also can work very well. So whenever is a retropulse globe, you have to take care. Uh, do the force duction test for SO. If it is minimal laxity, definite laxity, mark laxity, or ten tendon absent. Okay. So according to that, we can develop the algorithm of SO palsy treatment. That can be SO ten when there is SO tendon laxity or SR contracture. So this is again a whole algorithm we can follow, and it is mainly designed by NAFs. So uh, here you have to warn that if uncertain, always uh, err on side of the under correction of SO palsy because reverse diplopia will never be tolerated by the patient. Whenever bilateral SO palsy, we can again do IO recession or uh, uh, we can do again uh, IR recess, IR nasal transposition, MR down sheet, IO weaken, SO harada ito, SO tuck and other combination or more of this about treatment. Bio bilateral IO weakening also. The in this patient, we did bilateral IO weakening. And in this patient, simple medial cancer transposition could correct the uh, outlook of the patient. He is a gynecologist. So trochlear insertion, we don't do anything. SO overaction is very, very less, but we did in this patient. Uh, we saw this patient with uh, severe SO overaction that was also post trauma so we did silicone expander in we placed the silicone uh, in so so i'm just rushing to the video so this is the silicone expander placed in so and this is post op med somebody speaking on med no no you can wind up in a minute can or so can wind up. yeah thank you so much thanks Maybe a lot ma'am just conclude in a minute That's yeah <laughs> So this is MED, we, we all know what we do. There can be a NAPS procedure, modified NAPS procedure, ag augmented NAPS procedure, and modified Nishida's procedure, and associated with vertical transposition of horizontal recti. So in this patient, we did modified Nishida's technique, and which works very well in uh, even up to 35 to 40 prism, it can correct, along with the uh, Marcus gun also. This is cyclohorizontal. Uh, Cyclo vertical plus horizontal, that is third nerve palsy. We have a lot many options available. Uh, in this patient, we did the um, lateral rectus plication, uh, lateral rectus uh, dis uh, insertion, and then plicated to the periosteum fixation. So, and the in this patient, we did sup SO to MR and MR resection. So, that is the 
treatment we applied here for third now this is very very uncommon but we found the child and we just gave a tensilon test on table with our anesthetist and we can see it is a pure ocular myasthenia this is dvd and dhd i'll not go into detail of it thank you so much i am really grateful to dr dedia sir and dr shubhangi ma'am for allowing me to speak on this because this paralytic strabismus topic itself is very very vast and we cannot cover everything within 6 to 10 minutes but don't forget to look for the orbital tumors also such can such things can also cause the paralytic strabismus thank you thank you shreya for those wonderful cases and um, anyone in the audience wants to ask a question we can take a question and i in the meanwhile i call upon dr subhash dede who is uh, uh, an active member of sposi and uh, a co-opted member and he'll be speaking on minimally invasive strabismus thank you chair persons thank you sposi uh, just a minute is uh, professor raman yanu gandula here no no is not here so uh, thank you sposi thank you chair persons and dear friends i will be speaking on minimally invasive strabismus surgery so basically various type of incisions have been <coughs> popularized like limbal incision park phonicial incision swain's approach this minimally invasive skin surgery was popularized by dr mozon in 2007 or <coughs> doing minimally invasive skin surgery use of microscope is advocated and who wants to start they should start with primary horizontal rectus muscle dissections and plication of 4 mm or less preferred age group is between 14 to 40 years in very young patients there is abundant thin tissue which makes surgery more difficult and in older patients there is reduced elasticity of conjunctiva that increases the risk of conjunctival tear these are <coughs> routine instruments which are required for minimally invasive skin surgery so basically in minimally invasive skin surgery muscles are operated through several key hole openings instead of one large opening and tunnels are created between cuts for additional surgical steps and transconjunctival suturing technique is used to keep the key hole opening small so basically we have done a study from 2013 to 2015 and patients were divided into two groups one was minimally invasive skin surgery and other was conventional skin surgery and outcome measures in this study were conjunctival redness and swelling which was graded into 0 1 2 3 as absent mild moderate severe respectively and eyelid swelling so basically uh, for uh, doing this we have to make four points which are marked on the conjunctiva two at the upper and lower end of the rectus muscle insertion and two at the posterior limit of planned paramuscular conjunctival incision two small radial cuts are made one along the superior and other <laughs> along the inferior muscle margin anterior extent of the cut is at the level of the tendon insertion and size of cut depends on amount of muscle to be displaced and rule of thumb is the incision size should be 1 mm less than amount of the muscle displacement to be achieved then episcleral tissue is separated from the muscle sheath and sclera after identifying the borders of the muscle it is hooked to perform dissection two sutures uh, 60 yqil as routine are applied to the superior and inferior border of the muscle as close as possible to the insertion and after uh, measurement of the amount of the recession it is uh, reattached at the desired uh, place by the handbag technique and the conjunctiva is closed with 60 liquid using two sutures so this is the preoperative photograph in group 8a this is the post operative photograph on day 1 in group a patients and this is the photograph on day 7 and this is the photograph at 3 weeks for <coughs> group b conventional strabismus surgery limbal approach was used and <coughs> it was uh, uh, routine conventional strabismus surgery so this is the preoperative photograph in group b this is post operative photograph on day 1 
this is post operative photograph on day 7 and it is post operative photograph at 3 weeks so post operatively <laughs> we have to assess the eyelid swelling that is scored 0 to 3 absent mild moderate and severe conjunctival redness 0 to 3 in the category of absent mild moderate and severe and chemosis also <laughs> scored mild moderate and uh, severe so basically there was no statistically significant difference between both groups regarding pre-operative and post-operative amount of deviation and visual acuity however there was statistically significant difference in severity of redness in both groups at different point of times conjunctival redness was almost absent by three week in group a while mild to moderate redness was present in group b statistical <laughs> difference was uh, seen in uh, swelling and we found <laughs> the difference in our primary outcome was uh, in eyelid swelling and conjunctival redness on day one seven and three weeks as well however after three weeks both groups have similar outcome so at three weeks post surgery i looked normal or nearly normal in primary gaze position and uh, basically conjunctival opening is treated as reasonable distance from the cornea and it decreases the incidence of corneal delen formation there is avoidance of tenons of the uh, prolapse of the tenons and it is uh, minimizes the post-operative discomfort so what are the advantages of minimally invasive skin surgery basically placement of conjunctival incision away from the cornea leads to uh, <coughs> lesser post-operative complications there is minimi minimization of size of incision there is improved post-operative quality better cosmesis minimal tissue disruption improved function of ducted muscle less trauma to the operated area and ease of performing division surgery this is comparative chart of uh, miss and uh, conventional skin surgery and i would like to conclude with conventional uh, technique the conjunctiva is more at risk increased patient discomfort conjunctival redness stays <coughs> after three weeks and uh, with minimally invasive skin surgery level of subjective comfort is better than conventional limbal approach and severity of eyelid swelling was dramatically less so there is short post-operative period, less conjunctival scarring. So in a sense, we may conclude that minimally invasive skin surgery is technically more challenging, but has potential to provide increased patient comfort in immediate post-operative period. However, after three weeks, both are equally effective. Thank you. No, ma'am, I have already told 14 to 40 years. So in <coughs> younger patients, uh, basically the, there is more of the tenons uh, uh, tissue is there, so the chances are, uh, it should not be tried. And after 40 years, uh, the conjunctival elasticity, <coughs> there is more chances of conjunctival tears. Yes, no. uh, not in any patient. Uh, finally, ma'am, uh, basically, at, uh, 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 this study was done from uh, 2011 to 13, 14. After that, we have done two more theses, and now we are doing it in obliques also. So now I am uh, quite comfortable with this. So uh, yes, uh, for any initial procedures, there are chances of extension uh, of the incision. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the excellent uh, overview. Uh, I invite Dr. Sumita Agarkar to speak on pathological myopia. She is very proficient surgeon from Shankanetralaya, Chennai. Good morning. Thank you to Sposi and Madam President <laughs> for giving me this opportunity. So I'm talking about something when we see children like this in our clinic. 
<laughs> uh, when we see children like this, or this, or this, we are really not talking, thinking about atropine in these children or things in these children. We are also looking at what is causing so much of high myopia in these. So it's a high myopia is also pathological or high myopia is also going to be an impending epidemic and prevalence is expected to be 0.5 to 3 which makes it at least a uh, few million people if you look at world over it is going to be much higher in Asians. How do you define high myopia or pathological myopia? Any myopia who is which is more than six diopters increased axial length that is at least more than 26 millimeters which presents early in childhood progressive and most important what defines from a high myopia from a pathological myopia that there should be some amount of uh, pathological changes at the at the at the level of macula and retina so what causes these how wha what is the reason for this is basically it's excessive axial length elongation which produces a biomechanical stretch on the posterior pole leading to which in turn leads to staphyloma and optic disc changes you have a a tilted optic disc, you can have lacquer cracks or myopic macular degeneration and often uncorrectable visual loss. So this is what a typical pathological myopia looks like. This is not just high myopia. This is not just minus 13 because visual acuity is less and you can already see a macular changes as well as a tilted optic disc, myopic disc in this. So what does workup entail in these patients? You have to look for visual acuity, refraction, pupils, intraocular pressure, careful fundus examination with special attention to macula and optic nerve, and occasionally you may need imaging and OCT. So this is an older classification of pathological myopia, and we they use it, but it does not include the OCT or newer imaging techniques. So nowadays this has been modified. I've used it for easier understanding. So. What is the management in pathological myopia? The contact lenses work better than glasses and you should probably push for contact lenses than glasses in these children. A careful follow-up is required because some of them will have progressive myopic macular changes and it's ideal to probably have a retinal imaging for comparison during follow-up and you may need additional interventions for maculopathy and degeneration if it progresses further. What is syndromic myopia? On the other hand, syndromic myopia is actually myopia associated with ocular and systemic disorders. It is monogenic with a wide spectrum of clinical presentations. Why approach is different? Put a mic past me. Why approach is different in pathologic myopia versus syndromic myopia? Because these are younger children. There is a real risk of visual impairment and myopia may be just the tip of the iceberg and there is a possibility of genetic transmission in these. So workup in these children involves a little bit more history, a more careful visual acuity, intraocular pressure, and a detailed fundus evaluation. In addition to just these, which is part of any comprehensive ophthalmic examination, you may also need to do imaging, electrophysiology, OCT, and genetic testing, depending on what you see. So these are the common syndromes which are associated with myopia. Children may present only with myopia, but you have to look at all these things, especially if you see a very high myopia, visual impairment, and uh, relatively normal looking fundus. So what are the red flags to pick up syndromic myopia? Family history, birth history, history of consanguinity, history of first degree relatives with visual impairment, younger children with high myopia, for, uh, visual acuity which is not improving despite wearing glasses and patching, presence of nystagmus which unless you look for it sometimes easy to miss, poor color vision dysmorphic features and altered fundus background and more before anything else appears arterial attenuation is the only thing which sometimes can be seen if when the child presents to you at the age of three years or four years. So if you look at this picture this is a 13 year old came with nearly normal looking eye uh, on examination but if you do autofluorescence you can see definitely there is problem in the macula. And again, the red flag here was a mac visual acuity with moderate myopia. She should see 6 by 6. Why is she six only 6 by 18? That's what should give you the pointer here. And of course, when you do an examination, color vision was poor. If you actually do look at her ERG, ERG was normal. Full field ERG was normal because it's just a macular pathology there. 
Uh, but if you do a multifocal ERG, you can see depressed macular region. And of course, OCT, when she was a little older than what she first presented with, uh, we did OCT and that showed povular thinning. And of course, we did a genetic testing in her and mutation was seen in CNGB3, which is associated with achromatopsia. Her father also had a mutation in the same region. She was counseled and low vision devices were prescribed. Another patient, patient two, he, this is a 10 year old, history of poor vision. Again, visual acuity is 618, has been wearing glasses. Minus eight with 618, doesn't correlate. This is not amblyopia. This is something else going on. So on cover test, she, is a, she has exotropia. But in the fundus evaluation, when you see a dilated fundus evaluation, you can see a temporal avascular area with multiple lattices in both the eyes. There is a avascular wedge, which is extending right up to the fovea in the right eye. So there is a, uh, if you see picture here, there is, uh, is there a pointer? Pointer? No. Sir, cursor. Cursor, <laughs> my cursor is not showing up here. <laughs> so you, you can see temporarily there is a kind of a he fibrous wedge. Okay. He has pointer. Okay. He carries his pointer all the time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> this one is positioning not too great. So you can see here, that is a fibrous uh, wedge which is coming right up to a vascular area. Retina, as you can see, there are no vessels there. And more, more easily visible in the left eye, you can see a temporal avascular area. And sometimes when they are not dilating poorly, they are not looking at where you want them to look. These are things which are easier to miss. And that's where sometimes photography is probably uh, useful. So here the, the diagnosis was either FEVR because of this avascular area with the fibrous edge or a regressed ROP, but she didn't have any history of ROP. Now more history was taken. Father has poor vision in one eye. History of retinal detachment surgery. Father was also examined and uh, that is her father. So you know this is not regressed ROP and this probably is FEVR which is, uh, you can see similar fundus picture in the father also. So yes, she was given glasses and need for close follow-up was explained because she had multiple lattices. She needs more periodic examination, but that's how sometimes it helps you to come to the diagnosis. Again, another patient. This patient has dysmorphic features. Uh, both eyes CSM, minus 21, minus 23, anterior segment normal. Posterior pole looks okay. However, when we do optos, it shows multiple lattices. There is, again, more history. History of detachment in father and brother. Brother also has had a cleft lip surgery. And yes, when we do a genetic t testing, there is mutation. This is the mother uh, in call 2A1. And probably they have sticklers because of multiple lattices, dysmorphic features, cleft lip. All these are uh, associations with sticklers. This is, I think, a brother. Again, another patient, eight year old, poor vision, nystagmus, delayed milestones, cyst in the occipital region. Uh, if you look at the anterior segment, uh, one eye has total cataract, other eye has uh, non dilating pupil with small, but we were able to take optos. On optos, it looks like retina is attached, but when we do an ultrasound, it shows retinal detachment in both eyes. Right eye, of course, had no view, but left eye, where what we could see was only this much here. So this looks Maybe pale disc, but nothing else. On uh, ultrasound, there was some retinal detachment in both the eyes. Uh, and Optos does confirm retinal detachment in the periphery. We look at the brother who is visually impaired, occipital encephalocele in him also, right eye hand movements, left eye no PL, nystagmus, anterior segment, both eyes cataract, and ultrasound shows total retinal detachment in both the eyes. Genetic testing was done and mutation in call 18A, suggestive of no block syndrome. So sometimes family history is important and you need to probably uh, look at more, more than just uh, patient, but also family members as well as more detailed history. So how do we help these children? You should give optical correction, glasses or contact lenses. You should not, vision is improving to 18, minus 18, three by 60, I will not give glasses. That's not the right approach to do it. You should give minus 18. Diagnostic imaging, is required whenever it is uh, indicated, close monitoring and follow-up, interventions in terms of laser, cataract surgery, retinal surgeries is all required during the course of follow-up. Several of them will have progressive visual impairment despite your best efforts. So low vision services may be required 
you may need to help them by giving them appropriate certifications of disability and facilitating their access to services and whatever little benefits governments offer. Genetic testing and counseling, of course, they are young children. They may, parents may want to have another child. They may need to know what's happening. You need to offer them these services or at least refer them from a, to a center where it can be done. Cataract may be a presenting feature and surgery can be challenging in terms of dilatation, deep set eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, strabismus may be surgery may be required because both ESO and exotropia are seen. Uh, this is I'm talking in terms of more interventions which may be required just along with glasses. So imaging of muscle helps in the surgical plan as displacement of the muscle may not respond to traditional surgical plans. Uh, important to measure with contact lenses because their angles are different because of high myopia and you should always be aware of a very thin sclera in these patients. Thank you for your attention. Sometimes it is difficult to do an OCT. Yeah. Sometimes I yeah, feel like seeing how is the macula, but then it uh, doesn't uh, come, the picture. Yeah, at some point you will get it. But uh, as I said, your, ma your OCT decision is not going to change your management majorly. Yes. Maybe counseling may change a bit, but it is not. So till you get a good picture, there's no harm in continuing with whatever you need to do for w to preserve the vision, to follow up, to make sure that you are not missing out on any lattices and yeah. any other dangerous lesions yeah. which need to be treated. So and then, yeah, clinically, how would you nail that these are pathological and not just the simple myopia which is beyond minus six? As uh, I mentioned those red flags, which were actually not improving, definitely a red okay. flag, uh, despite wearing glasses sometimes very abnormally high myopia. And as I said, fa family history is important. Some of it is not volunteered, yes. mind you. They will not tell an another brother who is not worried, <laughs> unless you ask for it. So family history of first degree relatives having poor visual outcome, or poor in vision is a very, very important red flag. And a lot of this history is not volunteered, yes. unless you ask for it. So you have to, yeah, yeah, yes. and arterial accumulation. But a simple pathological myopia which is not going to lead very la very bad visual impairment or other syndromes you will probably see the macular changes there is a macular uh, thinning. Uh -huh, thinning and all which is clinically very obvious yes you can confirm it with OCT but you will get OCT picture at some point in there yeah. follow up thank you Dr. Sumita for a nice presentation uh, now I invite our president Dr. Shubhangi Bhave She'll be speaking on recent advancement in strabismus surgery. Over to you, Dr. Sh <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. As I've said, uh, it's heartening to see uh, these many people in the audience <laughs> on the last session of the last day and uh, someone has to do a last session. So that is how it goes. And uh, I'll be speaking on recent advances in uh, strabismus surgery. No financial interest. Now strabismus surgery has uh, advanced rapidly in last few years. Better understanding of physiology. Yeah. Detecting the presence of Muscle pulleys, better visualization of muscle due to advances in imaging uh, has all made this possible. Many new procedures are introduced in the recent times. For the paralytic squints in six nerve palsies, we always had VRT of superior and inferior rectus done to LR, but they may have a risk of anti-segment ischemia. So Nishida's partial tendon transposition, a new addition to the armamentarium has come. And now it's been slightly modified. And uh, so this is the diagrammatic representation, which was also shown by Shriya, that uh, we are taking a non-absorbable suture on superior and inferior rectus, about 8 to 10 millimeters behind the insertion. 
and putting it to a point on the sclera in between, if we are doing it for lateral rectus, in between the super rectus and lateral rectus and inferior rectus and lateral rectus. If we are doing it for vertical, as in uh, uh, MED, then we are putting it between superior and lateral and medial rectus and uh, superior rectus. So mm, that is how it goes. Um, this is a, sorry. This is a small video of uh, Nishida's uh, procedure. So this is the lateral rectus which is hooked. This is done for the LR palsy. This is the superior rectus muscle. About uh, We need to uh, clear the muscle uh, till far back. We are applying 5-0 ethy bond. And then this point is taken about uh, 8 to 10 millimeters behind the uh, uh, limbus in the superotemporal quadrant. And similarly, it is done on the inferior rectus muscle. I'll just fast forward it slightly. So this is how. It's a simple procedure. No cut, no... Uh, uh, mm, in no cut involved and so... Uh, we are sparing the uh, vessels, the ciliary vessels. And so the advantage of this procedure is we can combine it with the, uh, like in cases of MED, we can combine it with inferior rectus recession. Or in cases of six nerve palsy, we can combine it with uh, the medial rectus recession. So now this is a child having a left eye monocular elevation deficit with very dense amblyopia. He didn't have a good fixation. There was a large hypotropia with exotropia and left eye had a grade 4 elevation deficit was not coming up to midline. Horizontal movements though were normal. And this is after the left inferior rectus uh, recession in the left eye with modified nishida, nishidas to left superior rectus. We did it in one sitting. Uh, though there is still residual hypo with exo, but uh, at least uh, we could uh, cover his uh, um, hypotropia to a large extent. So complete third nerve palsy again is a challenge to every strabismologist. Periosteal anch anchoring of medial rectus. This fixates the eye in and desired position with the help of non-absorbable suture uh, between the medial rectus and anterior lacrimal crest and can be combined with supramaximal recession of lateral rectus. So this is the periosteal fixation being done, the uh, non-absorbable suture is taken on the anterior palpebral ligament, uh, the lacrimal crest, and the needle is brought in the orbit. Not a very good quality video. And uh, in we tie it to the, uh, in, uh, to the sclera in front of the medial rectus. And this, of course, we have to combine it with a large LR recession uh, so that uh, we can bring this. And the trick in this is uh, to keep the muscle in slightly esotropic position so because it is known to drift afterwards again postoperatively. So this was a complete third nerve palsy following a road traffic accident and an exotropia of about 80 prism diopters with hypotropia. And this is after the procedure, though exotropia could be corrected, but uh, the ptosis could not, because, uh, could not be corrected because he had a poor bells. The other procedures are periosteal fixation of lateral rectus can be done because that's the only muscle which is working. And we can do a, a Y-split and medial transposition of LR. This was introduced by Taylor and then Kaufman, but the Gogikits med modification is the one which we all follow, where the LR is split and the tendon is passed beneath the superior rectus, superior oblique, superiorly, and inferior rectus, inferior oblique, inferiorly, and tied one millimeter posterior to upper and lower insertion or insertion of medial rectus. I think this video of mine is not working. I'll just see if it, no, not working. I saw it in the morning. Anyway, 
then we come to another new procedure that is muscle transplantation. This I'll tell about this as we see the video. Here it is uh, done in um, sensory cases where the vision is very poor and mm, uh, normally uh, in esotropias we get a good result but I have done it in cases of sensory exotropia. This is the lateral rectus muscle which I have put it on the non-absorbable and this is the medial rectus and I'm planning about 8 millimeter resection of the medial rectus and two sets of vicral sutures are applied and then uh, one the the one or the medial rectus is then sutured to the insertion and this segment of the uh, cut muscle is then taken on the lateral uh, rectus sutured with non-absorbable and then this is also recessed according to the plan. So, so basically uh, we are doing, uh, we are keeping the muscle in front of the equator in this so we are not doing that is the difference between supramaximal recession and muscle transplantation. So we do not get any limitation of uh, ocular movements. If you see now this patient who had a sensory exotropia, he had surgery for traumatic cataract and uh, in childhood and see the poor fixation and large exotropia and he was not interested in surgery on his right eye. So we operated his left eye doing muscle transplantation and we could get a good result which has remained stable over uh, two or three years now. Coming to the loop myopexy, I'm taking two or three minutes extra because <laughs> there's no one after me to speak. So loop myopexy has been introduced as Dr. Sumita was saying, we need to do these in cases of high myopia or myopic strabismus fixes where the pathology is the displacement of the muscles because of high myopia. The SR shifts nasally and the IR shifts uh, uh, LR shifts inferiorly. This is the way I do the loop myopexy. The silicon um, uh, tube loop myopexy I do. The superior rectus and lateral rectus are uh, isolated and we are taking about 12 millimeters behind the limbus. We are making a scleral groove with the help of a crescent. One has to be very careful as these are highly myopic eyes with thin sclera. And then we take a silicon sling which is put through the superior rectus through this scleral groove and then brought out to, uh, through the lateral rectus. One has to write the paths of superior and lateral rectus which will correct the esotropia in a good way. So after passing the silicon sling through the sleeve, I tie it with a non-absorbable, cover it with tenons first and then conjunctiva so as to avoid extrusion of the silicon sleeve. So this is how the surgical procedure goes and this can be combined with medial rectus recession. Now you see this uh, lady who had a large esotropia and hypotropia of about 80 to 85 prism diopters and she had a high myopia of minus 11 in one eye and minus 16 in the other eye and there was an abduction and elevation deficit in the left eye. Can, can it be seen the elevation deficit and abduction deficit? And then postoperatively, we could get a good correction after doing bilateral medial rectus recession with a loop myopexy. In the left eye, her, uh, she was practically straight and uh, her abduction and elevation also improved. So right uh, procedure should be done uh, and imaging is important because imaging uh, gives you an idea about the uh, position of the muscles. Minimally invasive strabismus surgery as has been full talk. We have listened by Dr. Subhash. So nothing much to say about it. 
So to conclude, there are many new procedures are described describe nowadays and there are exciting time ahead for strabismologists. It's not the same recess resect. We are uh, indulging in various new procedures for DVD. Each one is coming with good results and so one has to try so many new procedures. This is a team at Drishti and I take this opportunity to ask you all to join us uh, at Nagpur on 7th and 8th of December for the annual sports event. And you Thanks. can announce for midterm also. Midterm yes, uh, the midterm uh, mid meeting is at Kozikode on 26th of May. 26th of May. 26th of May. 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 26th of May, Dr. Lela Mohan would be uh, doing this meeting. It was very, very nice presentation, Dr. Shubhangi. And you. you're using 240 band Myra, right? Huh? For the 240 band Myra. Yeah, I'm using 240. Uh, uh, so in that, band. even if you have uh, this uh, knot, uh, which tie by itself, so you okay. don't have to suture with okay. this clara. OK, OK. That's very good. I don't way suture of this to like clara. Yeah. I pass it through the sleeve, sleeve, and I suture the sleeve and the band. So if you are not putting sleeve, there is a technique of putting the knots which okay. which retinal surgeons are using okay. when they do uh, <laughs> buckle uh, okay buckling procedure no, it's, it's available, available. it's yeah, available yeah, it's available it is available i also divide it into two because it's too long a yeah. sleeve yeah. it's a it's too long the the sleeve is too long so i cut it into two so we don't have to pass it through a longer Thank you so much. Any yeah. question? For Any her? questions? I specifically, I, I don't prefer to use glue. Though we use glue just to glue the conjunctiva rather than uh, we don't have to put the suture on conjunctiva. So I'm doing lots of OSD. So we r rest of the glue I use too, but not for the muscle. Not for oh the muscle. As such, it is not yeah. seen why to use. She's asking glue. Glue for the muscles. I, I don't think any of us is using. Oh, only for the conjunctive. Only for the Now I have been doing plication since last four years. Uh, I have not found any difference between the resection and plication. But I have seen that when you do a uh, muscle sclera muscle technique, it works much better. What, okay. what yeah. Anybody can prefer any choice. But muscle to muscle, rather than muscle to muscle, I pass through sclera. So, so that Sharma works very nice. video is there on the YouTube. You can. I thank my co-chair, Dr. Subhash, uh, Dr. Shreya, and uh, all the speakers and the wonderful audience. Dr. So John, welcome sorry. to our session. <laughs> and uh, we can have a group photograph of yeah. Dr. Sunita.